me. I'm going to bring up Michael Pollan. He's the director of Exploration Architecture. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's, it's great to be here. I'm an architect, and I'm going to be talking about biomimicry, which I think is genuinely one of the most powerful sources of innovation uh, that is going to help us go beyond conventional approaches to sustainable design to achieve restorative approaches. And I'll give a couple of very quick examples of what I mean by biomimicry. This is abalone shell, and uh, at a chemical level, it's almost identical to chalk, ordinary chalk, but because of the microstructure, it achieves 3,000 times the toughness. So if we could achieve similar manufacturing technology, then we could really start to make uh, rapid uh, progress. And uh, this is my current favorite. This is called the dog vomit slime mold. And um, slime molds are unicellular organisms which form minimum distance networks between sources of food. And in 2009, scientists at Hyder University in Japan carried out an experiment with a map of the Tokyo region. They put a little source of food on each of the cities around Tokyo, and then they put a slime mold on Tokyo itself. The slime mold spread out uh, pretty quickly. It located all the sources of food, and then it started to optimize the connections between them. And at the end of that, layout exactly matched the layout of the railway network in that part of Japan. It had taken the engineers thousands of hours to arrive at that optimization. The slime mold did it in 26 hours. And um, this is what Amory Lovins refers to as, you know, nature is like a source book in which all the products have benefited from a 3.8 billion year research and development period. I tend to talk about biomimicry in terms of achieving three major transformations. One is radical increases in resource efficiency. The second is linear to closed loop. And the third is shifting from a fossil fuel economy to a solar economy. And if we choose to embark on these, I see them as very much interlinked uh, journeys. For me, there is no better source of ideas than, than biomimicry. So I'm going to talk about two projects, very briefly, that explore these ideas. The first is an office building. And there have been plenty of sustainable offices around. We wanted to try and go beyond that. We had a hunch that we could using biomimicry. And the first thing that we looked at was daylight, how to bring daylight into this building so as far as possible it could be in, entirely uh, naturally lit. And uh, we had a biologist as part of the design team, and we looked at a whole range of examples of biological organisms that gather and distribute light. So this one is the spookfish, and it has these amazing mirror sh structures in its eyes, which focus very low-level bioluminescence onto its retina. Another one we looked at is the stone plant. This is a plant that lives in deserts, and for reasons of thermal stabilization, most of the plant is below ground. And then the photosynthetic matter is down in what you could call a basement, and it has a roof light that brings the light down to the photosynthetic matter where it can, the chemical reactions can take place at a steady temperature. The brittle star, this is a starfish that lives as much as 500 meters below the ocean surface, where light levels are incredibly low, and it's evolved a covering of near optically perfect lenses over its skin. And those lenses focus light so the brittle star can detect predators long before the predators see it. Now, when you're working on um, daylights in office buildings, a fairly common way of doing this is to just think about the right distance between the windows. And in London, you can find a lot of examples of offices that are as deep as 25 or even 30 meters. And with that kind of floor depth, they're bound to be high energy buildings because they're artificially lit, very heavily air conditioned, and so on. We concluded that the right dimension was about 12 meters. So then thinking about what kind of building form this suggested, uh, one approach would be to just take these narrow floor plates and to stack them up into a tower form. And that would be fine if we were working on a, a dense urban location with high land values. We wanted to develop a concept that was more universal than that. So we looked at two other building forms. One was a, a ring of office floors around a central atrium. And then the third one was a more linear approach with two thin linear blocks and an atrium down the middle. And it was the third one that seemed to work best when we analyzed the light levels. We analyzed the light levels by looking at it in plan on the computer. And what we found is that we got a kind of curved pattern of shading towards the middle of each block because of the shading effect of the opposite block. So then the next design move was to curve those floor plates so that we would get a very steady, very even quality of light all the way along. And that produced two further challenges. Uh, the first is that narrow floor plates aren't particularly good for creative clusters of people. You need some areas that are wider. And also, this wasn't making very efficient use of a rectangular site. We we're probably going to end up with a rectangular site. So then learning from um, the way that uh, surface area and volume are optimized in biology, 
we elaborated this plan form into this sort of undulating shape in which we still had no point that was further than six meters from the nearest window, but now we were getting much better facilities for creative clusters of people. We also looked at the uh, daylight from in the section of the building and uh, worked out that uh, we were actually getting quite a lot more light at the top than we were at the bottom. We needed to find ways of bringing light further down. So we thought about actually harvesting light from the top uh, and focusing it into fiber optic tubes. And for this, we looked at a rainforest plant called Anthurium waraquinum, which has lenses very much like the brittle star all over its leaves. And somehow those focus diffuse light, which is amazing. There are products that focus parallel rays from sunlight, but somehow this plant focuses diffuse light. We concluded that we wanted to shape the building to uh, get more light down into the lower parts. And we proposed a large-scale light reflector, very similar to the spookfish's eye. It was a mirror, basically, that would bounce light deeper into the lower floors. And then thinking about what we would do under that reflector, we thought this would be a great place to design a, a really uh, fantastic meeting space uh, that would add value to the building. And designing for high levels of daylight has a secondary benefit. Uh, these three plants in sufficient quantities can deal with nearly all the in indoor contaminants in an indoor environment. And in a scheme in India, they've achieved remarkable results. 50% redu reduction in headaches and eye complaints, 20% increase in productivity, even a measurable increase in blood oxygen levels. When it came to the structure, uh, we saw that it's daylight that has been the primary shaper of the building. So with the structure, the way we used biomimicry was to try and uh, reduce the amount of material that we needed. And we looked at examples like uh, bird skulls and cuttlebone. And what you find is really very complex structures that achieve remarkable efficiency by putting the material in exactly the right place. So bird skulls have these very thin layers of bone connected together by struts and ties. So it's like a combination of dome technology and space frame technology. The other main one we looked at was uh, cuttlebone, which is quite similar. Again, it has very thin layers of, of bony material, this time connected together by these sort of undulating walls. So both of these were incredibly strong, very stiff materials uh, using a minimum of resources. Then we analyzed a fairly generic floor in a column arrangement, and we analyzed it in terms of which bits were working hard and which bits were structurally redundant. And all the bits that uh, I'm about to shade in uh, dark here, all of these are structurally redundant. They're not doing anything. That is just a waste of resources. And if we were to actually shape the building following the shape that it wants to be, it would probably look something like this. We would end up with deeper floors in the middle where the bending moments are highest. We would have hollow columns uh, because the center of the column is not doing anything. And then we would take out some of the excess material in the floors with hollow voids like this technology called bubble deck. So we were actually getting reasonably close to the kind of efficiency that we were seeing in the cuttlebone and the bird skulls and achieving at least a 50% reduction in concrete. With 3D printing, we could take that even further and uh, with biological polymers, achieve a fully cyclical approach. Now, if I had more time, I'd love to tell you how we learned from termites to design a passive uh, heating and cooling system, how we learned from mimosa leaves and beetle wings to design a shading system, and from shells and leaves to design a glazing system that achieved a 50% reduction in materials. This is how the scheme looks now. So you can see many of the ideas I mentioned, and uh, this is how the atrium would look. And one of the engineers involved has predicted that when this gets built, it'll be one of the lowest energy office buildings in the world. And I would argue that this is actually going beyond uh, sustainable to achieve restorative uh, solutions. The, the air coming out would be cleaner than the air going in. It would be restorative to the human spirit to be generating more energy than it needs, and so on. So now the Sahara Forest Project, this is a proposal to bring together a number of technologies in synergistic ways and to use integrated solutions to tackle some pretty big challenges of climate change, water shortages, food security, and energy security. And if you're working in an extreme environment and you're into biomimicry, then there's a lot that you can learn from the organisms that, that live there. And uh, this is one of the heroes of the project. This is the Namibian fog basking beetle, which has evolved a way of harvesting its own fresh water in a desert. And we learned from this to develop a new type of greenhouse, cooled and humidified with seawater, and it produces a certain amount of fresh water which we can use for the crops. And then we looked at ways of bringing this together with other symbiotic technologies. And this is the one we settled on, concentrated solar power, or CSP. And both of these, the CSP and the greenhouse, work very well in hot, sunny deserts. The CSP benefits from seawater cooling. It produces more electricity. We can make use of all that waste heat to evaporate more seawater in the greenhouse and create more fresh water. And then the shade created by the mirrors makes it possible to grow a whole range of plants 
uh, underneath that would not grow in direct sunlight. So this is how the scheme looked five years ago. Um, it's a model for how we could create zero carbon crops in some of the most water-stressed parts of the planet, as well as revegetating areas of desert and creating renewable energy. We were fortunate in getting together some uh, funding for this, and then we carried out feasibility studies, looking at what other technologies we could bring into this, such as halophytes, which are plants that can grow directly in seawater, algae for biofuels, evaporator hedges that take the, the brine from the greenhouse and dry it out to dry salts so we can start to extract useful compounds and minerals and get the nutrients back into desert soils. And in a way, this was a bit like a sort of plumbing exercise, looking at each of these technologies in terms of its inputs and outputs, and then trying to get the output from one to become the input for something else in that system. And don't try and read all this, but this shows how the system works all together uh, with all the interconnections. And although that might look complicated, it's nowhere near as complex as a real ecosystem. And I would argue this is the kind of complexity that we're going to need to embrace if we're really to make progress over the next few decades. So we built a version of this in Qatar. We tested this. This was a great opportunity for us to refine all the parts of the system. It was opened by the Emir of Qatar during the climate change talks and managed to produce cucumbers, really good levels of productivity matching European greenhouses all the way through the summer. Most greenhouses in Qatar closed for about three months. The aim was to really uh, model this very closely on biological systems. So whereas conventional human-made systems are simple and disconnected, biological systems are complex and interconnected, closed loop, zero waste, uh, they're adapted to constant change, no long-term toxins are used, etc. And, and the key one is uh, they're regenerative. I think that right-hand list is actually a very good summary of the transformations we need to bring about over the next few decades. The last one there was regenerative. So we monitored what uh, happened to biodiversity on this site, uh, just in one kingdom, which is the animal kingdom. And uh, bear in mind that we started out with a completely barren desert, and we knew that there was nothing there because we had an ecological survey done. So this diagram shows what, what we achieved with biodiversity. Uh, so there are three main areas. Um, birds, insects, and mammals, and these are the different uh, taxonomic uh, classifications. First thing to appear was flies, uh, they're not particularly exciting. Uh, within a few days of the first plants arriving on site, we had common house sparrows. Uh, pretty soon after that, we were getting insects, uh, uh, locusts, and critics, critics, sorry, crickets, and um, <laughs> within a month, the first butterfly, uh, and then we had more birds as the plants were getting established, then we had the first uh, problematic species, uh, rats. They started expanding rather quickly, but uh, we got those under control. Uh, we had the first uh, feral cat appearing, more and more insects and birds all the time, um, and so on. When we had the uh, first halophytes planted on site, we, had, we started getting much rarer birds, like uh, hoopoes and rufous-tailed shrikes and so on. And so that was, that was achieved in just eight months uh, on a pretty small uh, project. If we were to uh, build the next scale of project, uh, over a longer period of time, that restorative effect would be even more pronounced. And to um, draw together some conclusions now, uh, of course, some cynics might scoff at the idea of a, a solar economy or zero waste, but we know this is not the stuff of fantasy because the natural world is living proof of that possibility. And not just an ordinary possibility, but a wonderfully rich, restorative and abundant possibility. 3.8 billion years of R&D, 3.8 billion years of brilliant solutions illuminated by previously unimaginable digital de design tools and unimaginable uh, scientific knowledge. Designers have never had such an opportunity to rethink and devise solutions fit for the next billion years. The circular economy I see as a very big part of the shift from the industrial age to the ecological age of humankind. And I firmly believe that biomimicry will be one of the best sources of ideas for all those that want to lead on that journey. Thank you very much.